A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatized by Michael Hartley. Starring Robert Powell as Sherlock Holmes and Dinsdale Landon as Dr. Watson. In which Dr. Watson meets Sherlock Holmes for the first time and they engage in a study in Scarlet. My military career had been interrupted during the second half... Confederate at the other end. ...by a Josiah bullet, which shattered my shoulder and grazed the subclavian artery. While convalescing from my wound at the base hospital of Peshire, I was struck down by enteric fever, that curse of our Indian positions, and it was not long before a medical board determined that not a day should be lost in returning me to England. Whence I arrived... A month later, with my health irretrievably ruined, but with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months attempting to improve it. I had neither kith nor kin in England, and was therefore as free as an income of eleven and sixpence a day will permit a man to be. It soon became apparent that I should have to find for myself some unpretentious and inexpensive domicile. Fortunately... A chance meeting in the Criterion Bar with young Stamford, who had been junior to me at Bart's, led in the right direction. I mentioned to him my desire to find comfortable rooms at a reasonable price. You know, Watson, that's a strange thing. You're the second man today that's used that expression to me. Really? Who was the first? A fellow working at the chemical laboratory up at the hospital. He was bemoaning himself this morning because he couldn't get someone to go halves with him in some nice rooms he'd found. Evidently too much for his purse. By Jove, if he really wants someone to share the rooms and the expense, I'm the very man for him. I should prefer having a partner to being alone. You don't know Sherlock Holmes, eh? Sherlock Holmes? No. Why? What is that against the man? Oh, I didn't say there was anything against him. As far as I know, he's a decent enough fellow. A medical student, I suppose. No, I've no idea what he intends to go in for. I believe he's well up in anatomy and he's a first-class chemist. But as far as I know, he has never taken any systematic medical classes. His studies are, well, desultory and eccentric. Yes. Well, if I am to lodge with anyone, I should prefer a man of studious and quiet habits. How could I meet this friend of yours? Oh, he's sure to be at the laboratory. He either avoids the place for weeks or else he works there from morning till night. If you like, we'll take a cab together. Capital. I should like that very much. Then let's drink up and we'll be on our way. You mustn't blame me, Watson, if you don't get on with him. If we don't get on, it would be easy to part company. You know, it seems to me, Stanford, you've some reason for washing your hands of the matter. Uh, Holmes is a little too scientific for my tastes. It approaches to cold-bloodedness. I can imagine his giving a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid simply in order to have an accurate idea of the effect. Really? Uh, but uh, to do him justice, I think he would take it himself with the same readiness. He appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge. Very right, too. Yes. But when it comes to beating the subjects in the dissecting room with a stick, it's certainly taking rather a bizarre shape. Beating the subjects? Yes. To verify how far bruises may be produced after death, I saw him at it with my own eyes. And yet you say he isn't a medical student. Oh, heaven knows what the object of his studies is. You must form your own impressions of him. Here we are. Ah, Holmes! Stam Stamford, I've found it. I have found it. I found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How are you? You've been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? Never mind. The question now is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. Let me explain. We came on business, Holmes. My friend here wants to take diggings, and as you were complaining that you could get no one to go halves with you, I thought I'd better bring you together. What a splendid idea. Oh. Dr. Watson... I have my eyes on a suite in Baker Street which will suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. I always smoke ships myself. Oh, that's good enough. And I generally have chemicals about and occasionally do experiments. Would that annoy you? By no means. Good. Now, 
Let me see. What are my other shortcomings? I get in the dumps at times and don't speak for days on end. You must not think I am sulky when I do that. Just let me alone and I'll soon be right. Now, what have you to confess? It's just as well for two fellows to know the worst of one another before they begin to live together. <laughs> well, I keep a bull pup and I object to row because my nerves are shaken. And I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours and I'm extremely lazy. I have another set of vices when I'm well, but those are the principal ones at present. Do you include violin playing in your category of rows? It depends on the player. A well-played violin is a treat for the gods. A badly played one, In that however, case, I think we may consider the thing as settled. That is, if the rooms are agreeable to you. When shall we see them? Call for me here at noon tomorrow, and we'll go together and settle everything. We met the next day as we had arranged, and inspected the rooms at number 221B Baker Street. The bargain was concluded upon the spot, and we at once entered into possession. Holmes was not a difficult man to live with. He was quiet in his ways, and his habits were regular. But as the weeks went by, my interest in him and my curiosity as to his aims in life gradually deepened and increased. My health forbade me from venturing out unless the weather was exceptionally genial, and I eagerly hailed the little mystery which hung around my companion and spent much of my time endeavouring to unravel it. Holmes was, of course, not slow to notice my curiosity, and at last thought fit to discuss our relationship. I trust, Doctor, that these few weeks have not proved to you that I'm too difficult a fellow lodger after all. Oh, far from it, Holmes. I don't mind admitting. You puzzle me, though. Puzzle you? But the way you work like a fiend sometimes, and at others, you lie on the sofa there hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning till night. And there's those curious visitors of yours. In one afternoon, a grey-headed, seedy fellow, looking like a peddler, then an old, white-haired gentleman, a fashionably dressed young girl, and a railway porter. And that sallow, rat-faced fellow, Lestrade, who has been here three times in a single week. But I always apologise for putting you to any inconvenience in the matter, Watson. I have to use this room as a place of business, and these people are my clients. But what... Never mind. You don't inconvenience me at all, Holmes. I'm only too pleased. Thank you. But tell me, have your observations of me over these weeks reached any sum total yet? You might think it a bit of a cheat, but I've been jotting down all the various points upon which you've shown me that you're exceptionally well informed. <laughs> oh, indeed. I should very much like to hear them. You would? I've, um, I've got the paper here somewhere. Yes. But here it is. I say you won't mind, really. Not at all. Well, it runs this way. Sherlock Holmes. His limits. One, knowledge of literature, nil. Two, knowledge of philosophy, nil. Three, knowledge of astronomy, nil. Four, Knowledge of politics, feeble. <laughs> oh, do go on. Uh, knowledge of botany, variable. Uh, well up in belladonna, opium and poisons generally. <laughs> knows nothing of practical gardening. Dear me. Uh, knowledge of geology, practical but limited. Tells at a glance different soils from each other. After walks, has shown me splashes upon his trousers and told me by their colour and consistence in what part of London he had received them. Seven, knowledge of chemistry, profound. Thank you. Eight, knowledge of anatomy, accurate but unsystematic. Nine, knowledge of sensational literature, immense. <laughs> <laughs> he appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century. Ten, plays the violin well. Eleven, is an expert single-stick player, boxer and swordsman. Twelve, has a good practical knowledge of British law. <laughs> oh, capital. I suppose I had better provide you with the answer to it all. You see, the theories of observation and deduction which I frequently express to you are really extremely practical. So practical that I depend upon them for my bread and cheese. How? Well, I have a trade of my own. 
suppose I'm the only one in the world. I am a consulting detective. Consulting detective? Here in London, we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are at fault, they come to me, and I manage to put them on the right scent. Lestrade is a well-known police detective. He got himself into a fog recently over a forgery case, and that was what brought him here. I see. And these other people? They're mostly sent on by private inquiry agencies. I listen to their story, they listen to my comments, and then I pocket my fee. But do you mean to say that without leaving this room, you can unravel some knot that other men can make nothing of? Hmm. I have a kind of intuition that way. Observation with me is second nature. You appeared to be surprised when I told you on our first meeting that you had come from Afghanistan. Well, yes. My train of reasoning ran thus. Here is a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man. Clearly an army doctor, then. He has just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, and that is not the natural tint of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardship and sickness, as his haggard face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen much hardship and got his arm wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan. The old train of thought did not occupy a second. <laughs> Well, it's simple enough as you explain it. <laughs> but, Holmes, I mean, I don't really think... It... I say, hmm? that fellow in the street, I wonder what he's looking for. <clears throat> oh. You mean the retired sergeant of marines? <laughs> no, that really is going too far. Oh, well, we shall soon see. He's coming to our door. Really? The trouble is, Watson, that there are no crimes and no criminals these days. What is the use of having brains in our profession? I know well that I have it in me to make my name famous. No man lives, or has ever lived, who has brought the same amount of study and of natural talent to the detection of crime which I have done. And what is the result? There is no crime to detect, or, at most, some bungling villainy with a motive so transparent that even a Scotland Yard official can see through it. Come in. A person to see you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Come in. Thank you, sir. Better by hand for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Thank you. Uh, may I ask, my good man, what your trade may be? Commission air, sir. Uniform way for repairs. And you were? Sergeant, sir. Royal Marine Light Infantry, sir. <sighs> no answer, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Sergeant. Well, I'm blessed. How in the world did you deduce that? Even when he was down in the street, I could see a great blue anchor tattooed on the back of that fellow's hand. That smacked of the sea. He had a military carriage, however, and regulation side whiskers. There we have the Marine. He was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command. You must have observed the way in which he held his head and swung his cane. A steady, respectable, middle-aged man, too, on the face of him. All facts which led me to believe that he had been a sergeant. Wonderful. Commonplace. Ah, but I said just now that there were no criminals. It appears that I'm wrong. Look at this. May I? Yes, read it. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes... There has been a bad business during the night at three Lauriston Gardens off the Brixton Road. Our man on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning, and as the house was an empty one, suspected that something was amiss. He found the door open, and in the front room discovered the body of a gentleman, well-dressed and having cards in his pocket bearing the name of Enoch J. Drebber, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. There had been no robbery nor is there any evidence as to how the man met his death. There are marks of blood in the room, but there is no wound upon his person. We are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house. Indeed, the whole affair is a puzzler. If you can come round to the house any time before twelve, you will find me there. Yours faithfully, Tobias Gregson. Hmm. Gregson is the smartest of the Scotland Yarders. He and Lestrade are the pick of a bad lot. They have their knives into one another, too. They're as jealous as a pair of professional beauties. There will be some fun over this case if they're both put upon the scent. But surely there isn't a moment to be lost. Shall I go and order you a cab? My dear fellow, 
what does it matter to me? Supposing I unravel the whole matter, you may be sure that Gregson Lestrade and company will pocket all the credit. But he begs you to help him. Yes, he knows that I am his superior and acknowledges it to me, but he would cut his tongue out before he'd owed it to any third person. However, we may as well go and have a look. I shall work it out on my own hook. I may have a laugh at them if I have nothing else. Come on, get your hat. You, you wish me to come? Yes, if you've nothing better to do. A minute later, we were both in a hansom, driving furiously for the Brixton Road. It was a foggy, cloudy morning, and a dull-coloured veil hung over the housetops. My companion was in the best of spirits and prattled away about the difference between a Stradivarius and an Amati. We were still a hundred yards or more from number three Lauriston Gardens when Holmes insisted upon our alighting, and so we finished our journey on foot. I had imagined that he would at once have hurried into the house and plunged into a study of the mystery. But nothing appeared to be further from his intention. He lounged up and down the pavement, gazed vacantly at the ground, the sky, and the houses opposite. Then he proceeded slowly down the path, keeping his eyes riveted on the ground. Twice he stopped, and once I saw him smile and utter an exclamation of satisfaction. In the hall of the house, we were met by a tall, white-faced, flaxen-haired man who rushed forward and wrung my companion's hands with effusion. Mr. Holmes, it's very kind of you to come. Ah, Inspector Gregson, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? I've heard everything left untouched. Oh, except the pathway up to the house. Oh? If a herd of buffaloes had passed along, there could not be a greater mess. No doubt, however, you had drawn your own conclusions before you permitted this. I uh, had so much to do inside the house, Mr. Holmes. My uh, colleague, Mr. Lestrade, is here. I had relied upon him to look after the path. With two such men as yourself and Lestrade upon the ground, there will not be much for a third party to find out. I think we have done all that can be done. It's a queer case, though, and I knew your taste for such things. Did you come here in a cab, Gregson? No, sir. Did Lestrade? No, sir. Then let us go and look at the room. This way, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Lestrade. I think you have met Dr. Watson. Of course, at your rooms. How do you do? This case will make a stir, sir. It beats anything I've seen, and I'm no chicken. You found no clue? None at all. Ah. You're sure there is no wound? There are splashes of blood all over the place. Positive. Then, of course, this blood belongs to a second individual, presumably the murderer, if murder has been committed. It reminds me of the circumstances attendant on the death of Van Janssen in Utrecht in 34. Do you remember the case, Gregson? No, sir. Read it up. Hmm? Oh, you really should. There is nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. Do you want to examine him, sir? Just a quick look, I think. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. Yes, patent leather boots. Well, I think I have seen everything I need to see. He's not been moved at all? No more than was necessary for the purposes of our examination. Then you can take him to the mortuary now. There is nothing more to be learned. Gregson had a stretcher and four men at hand. At his call, they entered the room and the stranger was lifted and carried out. As they raised him, a gold ring trickled down and rolled across the floor. Lestrade grabbed it up. There's been a woman here. It's a woman's wedding ring. Well, this does complicate matters. Heaven knows they were complicated enough before. You're sure it doesn't simplify them? Simplify? Oh, come, come, Gregson. There's nothing to be learned by staring at the ring. What did you find in his pockets? Uh, you see, sir. A gold watch and chain, gold ring with a Masonic device, gold pin, bulldog's head with rubies as eyes, cards of Enoch J. Drebber of Cleveland, corresponding with the EJD upon the linen. No purse, but loose money to the extent of seven pounds thirteen shillings. A pocket edition of Boccaccio's Decameron with the name of Joseph Stangerson upon the flyleaf. Two letters, one addressed to E.J. Drebber and one to Joseph Stangerson. At what address? Uh, American Exchange Strand, to be left till call for. They're both from the Guyon Steamship Company and refer to the sailing of their boats from Liverpool to New York. Have you made any inquiries as to this man Stangerson? Oh, I did at once, sir. 
I've had advertisements sent to all newspapers, and one of my men has gone to the American Exchange, but he's not returned yet. Have you sent to Cleveland? We telegraphed this morning. How did you word your inquiries? Well, we simply detailed the circumstances and said we should be glad of any information that could help us. Ah. You did not ask for particulars on any point which appeared to you to be crucial? I asked about Stangerson. Nothing else. Is there no circumstance upon which this whole case appears to hinge? Will you not telegraph again? I said all I have to say, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Gregson, I have just made a discovery of the highest importance and one which would have been overlooked had I not made a careful examination of the walls. Oh, Mr. Lestrade, and what is it? Look here, on this wall. Now, stand there, I'll strike a match. Look at that. What does it say? I, I can't quite see. R-A-C-H-E. Rach. Now, what do you think of that? The murderer's written it with his or her own blood. You see this smear where it's trickled down the wall? That disposes of the idea of suicide, anyhow. Why was that corner chosen to write it on? Well, I will tell you. See that candle on the mantelpiece? It was lit at the time. And if it was lit... This corner will be the brightest instead of the darkest portion of the wall. And what does it mean, now that you've found it? Why, it means that the writer was going to put the female name, Rachel, but was disturbed before he or she had time to finish. You mark my words. When this case comes to be cleared up, you will find that a woman named Rachel has something to do with it. <laughs> it's all very well for you to laugh, Mr Sherlock Holmes. Well, you may be very smart and clever, but the old hound is the best when all is said and done. I really beg your pardon, Miss Strade. You certainly have the credit of being the first of us to find this out, and as you say, it bears every mark of having been written by the other participant in last night's mystery. Yeah. I've not had time to examine this room yet, but with your permission, I shall do so now. As he spoke, he whipped a tape measure and a large, round, magnifying glass from his pocket. With these two implements, he trotted about the room. Sometimes stopping, occasionally kneeling, and once lying flat upon his face. He chattered away to himself the whole time, keeping up a running fire of exclamations, groans, and whistles. In one place, he gathered a little pile of grey dust from the floor and packed it away in an envelope. Finally, he examined with his glass the word upon the wall. This done, he appeared satisfied, for he replaced his tape and glass in his pocket. They say that genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains. It's a very bad definition, but it does apply to detective work. What do you think of it, sir? It would be robbing you of the credit of the case if I were to presume to help you. You're doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere. If you will let me know how your investigations go, I shall be happy to give you any help I can. In the meantime, I should like to speak to the constable who found the body. Is he here? Uh, no, he's off duty now. Then can you give me his name and address? Uh, yes, his name's John Rance. And you'll find him at uh, 46 Audley Court, Kennington Park Gate. 46 Audley Court, Kennington Park Gate. Thank you. Come along, Doctor. We shall go and look him up. I'll tell you, gentlemen, one thing which may help you in the case. What is that, sir? There has been a murder done. And the murderer was a man. He was more than six feet high, was in the prime of life, had small feet for his height, wore coarse, square-toed boots, and smoked a Trichinopoly cigar. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer had a florid face, and the fingernails on his right hand were remarkably long. These are only a few indications, but they may assist you. <laughs> this man was murdered, Mr. Holmes. How was it done? Poison. One other thing, Miss Strade. Don't waste your time looking for Miss Rachel. Rache is the German word for revenge. Come along, Doctor. It was one o'clock when we left number three, Lauriston Gardens... Sherlock Holmes led me to the nearest telegraph office, where he dispatched a long telegram. He then hailed a cab and ordered the driver to take us to the address of Constable John Rance. There is nothing like first-hand evidence. As a matter of fact, my mind is entirely made up on the case, but still we may as well learn all that is to be learned. You amaze me, Holmes. And surely you're not as sure as you pretend to be of all those particulars you gave Gregson. There's no room for a mistake. 
The very first thing which I observed on arriving there was that a cab had made two ruts with its wheels close to the curb. Now, up to last night, we have had no rain for a week, so that those wheels which left such a deep impression must have been there during the night. There were the marks of the horse's hoofs, too, the outline of one of which was far more clearly cut than that of the other three, showing that there was a new shoe. Since the cab was there after the rain began and was not there at any time during the morning, I have Gregson's word for that, it follows that it must have been there during the night, and therefore that it brought those two individuals to the house. Well, that seems simple enough, but how about the other man's height? The height of a man in nine cases out of ten can be told by the length of his stride. And I had this fellow's stride both on the clay outside and on the dust within. Then I had a way of checking my calculation. When a man writes on a wall, his instinct leads him to write about the level of his own eyes. Now, that writing was just over six feet from the ground. Is there anything else that puzzles you? Mm, the fingernails and the Trichinopoly cigar. The writing on the wall was done with a man's forefinger dipped in blood. My glass allowed me to observe that the plaster was slightly scratched in doing it, which would not have been the case had the man's nails been trimmed. I gathered up some scattered ash from the floor. It was dark in colour and flaky, such an ash as is only made by Trichinopoly. I've made a special study of cigar ashes. In fact, I've written a monograph upon the subject. I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand, either of cigar or of tobacco. It's just in such details that the skilled detective differs from the Gregson and Lestrade type. And the florid face, then? Ah, that was a more daring shot, though I have no doubt that I was right. You must not ask me that at the present state of the affair. My head is in a whirl. The more one thinks of it, the more mysterious it grows. Now, how came these two men, if there were two men, into an empty house? How could one man compel another to take poison? Where did the blood come from? Now, what was the object of the murder, since robbery had no part in it? And how came the woman's ring there? And above all, why should the second man write up the German word, Raka, before decamping? I confess, Holmes, I can't see any possible way of reconciling all these facts. You sum up the difficulties of the situation succinctly and well, Watson. There is much that is still obscure, though I have quite made up my mind on the main facts. As to Paul Lestrade's discovery, it was simply a blind, and intended to put the police upon a wrong track by suggesting socialism and secret societies. It was not done by a German. Oh? If you'll notice, the A was written somewhat after the German fashion. Now, a real German invariably uses capitals in the English character, so that we may safely say that this was not written by one, but by a clumsy imitator who overdid his part. It was simply a ruse to divert the inquiry into a wrong channel. <laughs> I am not going to tell you much more of the case, Doctor. You know, a conjurer gets no credit when once he has explained his trick, and if I show you too much of my method of working... You will come to the conclusion that I'm a very ordinary individual, after all. Oh, I shall never do that. You have brought detection as near to an exact science as it ever will be in this world. I'll tell you one other thing. Peyton Leathers and Square Toes came in the same cab, and they walked down the pathway together as friendly as possible. Really? Hmm. Arm in arm, in all probability. When they got inside, they walked up and down the room, or, or rather, Peyton Leathers stood while Square Toes walked up and down. I could read all that in the dust, and I could read that as he walked, he grew more and more excited. That is shown by the increased length of the strides. He was talking all the while and working himself up, no doubt, into a fury. Then the tragedy occurred. Now, I've told you all I know myself. For the rest is mere surmise and conjecture. We have a good working basis, however, on which to start. Perhaps we shall learn a little more from Constable Rance. I'll tell it you from the beginning, gents. Now, I knew that them two houses in Lauriston Garden was empty. On account of him that owns them, won't have the drains seen to. Though the very last tenant that lived in one of them died of typhoid fever. So, I was knocked all in a heap at seeing a light in the window, and I suspected as something was wrong. There was no one in the street? Not a living soul, sir. Well, I pushed the door open. All was quiet inside, so I went into the room where the light was a-burning. There was a candle flickering on the mantelpiece, a red wax one. And by its light, I saw... Yes, I know all that you saw. Huh? You walked around the room several times, and you knelt down by the body, and then you well, walked through and tried the kitchen door. Well, well, then where you... was you it to see all that? It seems to me that you knows a good deal more than you should. 
<laughs> Here's my card. Don't get arresting me for the murder. I'm one of the hounds, not the wolf. Mr. Gregson or Mr. Lestrade will answer for that. Go on, though. What did you do next? Oh, I, I went back to the gate and sounded me whistle. Well, that brought Murcher and two more to the spot. Was the street empty then? Well, it was as far as anybody that could be of any good goes. What do you mean? I've seen many a drunk chap in me time, but never anyone so drunk as that cove. He was at the gate when I come out, a leaning up agin the railings and a singing at the pitch of his lungs about Columbine's newfangled banner or some such stuff. He couldn't stand far less help. What sort of man was he? He was an uncommon drunk sort of man. He'd have found himself in the station if we hadn't been so took up. His face? His dress? Didn't you notice them? I shall think I did notice them, seeing that I had to prop him up. Me and Murcher between us. He was a long chap with a, a red face, the lower part muffled around. Ah, with some... that will do. What became of him? Well, we'd enough to do without looking after him. I'll wager he found his way home all right. How was he dressed? A, a brown overcoat. Had he a whip in his hand? A whip? No. Ah, he must have left it behind. You didn't happen to see or hear a cab after that? No. Well, there's a half sovereign for you. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm afraid, I... Rance, that you will never rise in the force. Hmm? That head of yours should be for use as well as ornament. You might have gained your sergeant's stripes last night. The man whom you held in your hands is the man who holds the clue to this mystery and whom we are seeking. Oh, but I tell you... There is we... no use arguing about it now. I tell you that it is so. Come along, Doctor. Blundering fool! Just to think of his having such an incomparable bit of good luck and not taking advantage of it. Well, I'm rather in the dark still, Holmes. I, it's true that the description of his man tallies with your idea of the second part in this mystery. But why should he come back to the house after leaving it? The ring, man, the ring. That was what he came back for. If we have no other way of catching him, we can always bait our line with the ring. I shall have him, Doctor. I lay you two to one, I'll have it. Hmm. I must thank you for it all. Me? I might not have gone, but for you. And so have missed the finest study I ever came across. A study in scarlet. Eh? Hmm. Why shouldn't we use a little art jargon? There's a scarlet thread of murder running through the colourless skein of life. And our duty is to unravel it and isolate it, and expose every inch of it. Our morning's exertions had been too much for my weak health, and I was tired out. Holmes, on the contrary, departed in high spirits to hear a concert by the violinist Norman Neruda, for whom he had expressed great admiration. I lay down on the sofa and endeavoured to get a couple of hours' sleep. It was a useless attempt... Every time that I closed my eyes, I saw before me the distorted, balloon-like countenance of the murdered man. Holmes was very late in returning. So late that I knew that the concert could not have detained him all the time. Ah, oh, Watson. You're not looking quite yourself. This Brixton Road business has upset you. I do not suppose you've seen the evening paper. Uh, no. It gives a fairly good account of the affair. However, it does not mention the fact that when the man was raised upon the stretcher, a woman's wedding ring fell upon the floor. Oh. It's just as well it does not. Why? Look at this advertisement. I had one sent to every paper this morning, immediately after the affair. Um, In the farm column there. Ah, yes, yes. In Brixton Road this morning, a plain gold wedding ring found in the roadway between the White Hart Tavern and Holland Grove. Apply Dr. Watson, 221B Baker Street... Oh, excuse me using your name. If I use my own, some of these dunderheads would recognize it and want to meddle in the affair. Oh, that's all right. But supposing anyone applies, I have no ring. Oh, yes, you have. Here you are. This is almost a facsimile. I say. But who do you expect will answer this advertisement? Why? The man in the brown coat? 
Our florid friend with a square toe. But wouldn't he consider it too dangerous? Not at all. If my view of the case is correct, and I have every reason to believe that it is, this man would rather risk anything than lose the ring. On thinking the matter over, it must have occurred to him that it was possible that he had lost the ring in the road after leaving the house. What would he do then? He would eagerly look out for the evening papers in the hope of seeing it among the articles found. His eye, of course, would light upon this. He would be overjoyed. Why should he fear a trap? There would be no reason in his eyes why the finding of the ring should be connected with the murder. He will come. You shall see him within the hour. And then? Oh, you can leave me to deal with him then. By the way, have you any firearms? Yes, I have my old service revolver and a few cartridges. Mm, you'd better clean it and load it. He will be a desperate man. And though I shall take him unawares, it's as well to be ready for anything. Very well, then. I'll do it as soon as we've had dinner. Holmes, it's gone eight o'clock. Yes. We shall not have long to wait, I promise you. But I need not have been anxious, for she sang it out loud enough for it to be heard at the other side of the street. Drive to 13 Duncan Street, Houndstitch, she cried. This begins to look genuine, I thought. 
And having seen her safely inside, I perched myself behind. Perched yourself? Oh, that's an art which every detective should be an expert at. Well, away we rattled. I never drew rein until we reached the street in question. I hopped off before we came to the door and strolled down the street in an easy, lounging way. I saw the cab pull up. The driver jumped down and I saw him open the door and stand expectantly. Nothing came out, though. When I reached him, he was groping frantically in the empty cab and giving vent to the finest assorted collection of oaths that ever I listened to. There was no sign or trace of his passenger, and I fear it'll be some time before he gets his fare. On inquiring at number 13, we found that the house belonged to a respectable paper hanger named Keswick, and that no one of the name either of Sawyer or Dennis had ever been heard of there. You don't mean to say that that tottering, feeble old woman was able to get out of the cab while it was in motion? <laughs> old woman be damned! We were the old women to be taken in. He must have been a young man, and an active one, too, besides being an incomparable actor. The disguise was inimitable. He saw that he was followed, no doubt, and used this means of giving me the slip. It shows that the man we are after is not as lonely as I imagined he was, but his friends were ready to risk something for him. <sighs> now, Doctor, you're looking done up. As you say, it's gone midnight. Take my advice. Turn in. Yes, I think I will. You turning in, too? Not yet a while. This smouldering fire and my violin will keep me company long into the watches of the night, I fancy. There is a strange problem still to unravel. A very strange problem indeed. Well, Holmes, the papers are certainly full of it today. They are calling it the Brixton Mystery. Ah, have they anything useful to tell us? Well, so far as I can see, most of them are concentrating on the victim's German name. Well, that won't get us far. Wait a minute. Now, this must be a later edition. Holmes, mm? they've identified the man. Have they, indeed? In that case, my dear Watson, pray post me up while I demolish this fourth egg. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, Holmes. The deceased was an American gentleman who had been residing for some weeks in the metropolis. He had stayed at the boarding house of Madame Charpentier in Torquay Terrace, Camberwell. He was accompanied in his travels by his private secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson. The two bade adieu to their landlady upon Tuesday the 4th inst and departed to Euston Station with the avowed intention of catching the Liverpool Express. They were afterwards seen together upon the platform. Hmm. Uh, nothing more is known of them until Mr. Drebber's body was, as recorded, discovered in an empty house in the Brixton Road, many miles from Euston. How he came there, or how he met his fate, are questions which are still involved in mystery. Nothing is known of the whereabouts of Stangerson. We are glad to learn that Mr. Lestrade and Mr. Gregson of Scotland Yard are both engaged upon the case, and it is confidently anticipated that these well-known officers will speedily throw light upon the matter. I told you that whatever happened, Lestrade and Gregson would be sure to score. Uh, that depends how it turns out. Ah, bless you. It doesn't matter in the least. If the man is caught, it will be on account of their exertions. If he escapes, it will be in spite of their exertions. It's heads I win and tails you lose. At this point, our conversation was rudely interrupted by the sudden and noisy entry into our rooms, amid many protesting cries of Mrs. Hudson, of a half a dozen of the dirtiest and most ragged street Arabs that I have ever clapped eyes on. Holmes did not seem at all taken aback, and immediately marshaled them into a line like so many disreputable statuettes. He questioned them, gave each of them a shilling, and with a wave of his hand, sent them scampering away downstairs like so many rats. I turned to him in amazement. Who or what on earth were they, Holmes? They are the Baker Street Division of the Detective Police Force. There's more work to be got out of one of those little beggars than out of a dozen of the regular force. Really? Hmm. The mere sight of an official-looking person seals men's lips. These youngsters, however, 
You go everywhere and see everything. They're as sharp as needles, too. All they want is organisation. Well, you're not employing them on this Brixton case, are you? Yes. There is a point which I wish to ascertain. It's merely a matter of time. Come in. Mr. Holmes, congratulate me. Ah, Inspector Gregson. I have made the whole thing as clear as day. You mean that you were on the right track? The right track? Why, we have the man under lock and key. And his name is? Arthur Charpentier, sub-lieutenant in Her Majesty's Navy. Oh. Take a seat and try one of these cigars. Oh, thank you. We're anxious to know how you managed it. Is it too early for some whiskey and water? No, I, I don't mind if I do. I'll get it. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. Mm. Uh, the tremendous exertions which I've gone through the last day or two have worn me out. Uh, not so much bodily exertions, you understand, as the strain upon the mind. You'll appreciate that, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, if we're both brain workers. Do me too much honour. Let us hear how you arrived at this most gratifying result. <laughs> the fun of it is, that fool Lestrade, who thinks himself so smart, has gone off upon the wrong track altogether. He's after the secretary, Stangerson, who had no more to do with the crime than the babe unborn. There you are, Inspector. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Good health, gentlemen. Good health. And how did you get your clue, Gregson? Ah. Well, the first difficulty which we had to contend with was finding this American's antecedents. Some people would have waited until their advertisements were answered or until parties came forward and volunteered information. And that's not Tobias Gregson's way of going to work. You, you remember the hat beside the dead man? Yes, by John Underwood and Son, 129 Camberwell Road. Oh, no idea you noticed that. Well, anyway, my belief is you should never neglect a chance, however small it may seem. To a great mind, nothing is little. Uh, yeah, quite, quite. Well, I went to Underwood and asked him if he had sold a hat of that size and description. He looked over his books and came on it at once. He had sent a hat to a, a Mr. Drebber, residing at Charpentier's boarding establishment, Torquay Terrace. Thus, I got his address. Smart. Very smart. <laughs> well, I next called upon Madame Charpentier. I found her very pale and distressed. Her daughter was in the room, too. An uncommonly fine girl she is, I may add. Though she was looking red about the eyes and her lips trembled as I spoke to her. That didn't escape my notice. You know the feeling, Mr. Holmes, when you come upon the right scent, a kind of thrill in your nerves. Before I even started to question them, I felt that these people knew something of the matter. Now, ladies, you have heard of the mysterious death of your late boarder, Mr. Enoch J. Drebber. <laughs> there, there, now, dear. Yes, sir, we have heard about it. Mm. And what o'clock did Mr. Drebber leave your house for the train? At eight o'clock. His secretary, Mr. Stangerson, said that there were two trains, one at 9.15 and one at 11, and he was to catch the first. And was that the last you saw of him? <laughs> Alice? Madame, I asked whether that was the last Yes, you... it was. Mother, no good can ever come of falsehood. We did see Mr. Drebber again, sir. Ah. Oh, God forgive you. You have murdered your brother. Arthur would rather we spoke the truth. Mm, and you best tell me all about it. Half confidences are worse than none. Besides, you do not know how much we know of it already. On your head be it, Alice. <laughs> Perhaps you'd better leave us together. Yes, Mother. Now, sir, I had no intention of telling you all this, but since my poor daughter disclosed it, I have no alternative. Having once decided to speak, I will tell you all, without omitting any particular. It is your wisest course, madam. Very well. Mr. Drebber had been with us nearly three weeks. He and his secretary, Mr. Stangerson, had been travelling on the continent. Stangerson was a quiet, reserved man. But his employer, I'm sorry to say, was far otherwise. Oh? He was coarse in his habits and brutish in his ways. How so? Well, the very night of his arrival, it became very much the worse for drink. And indeed, after midday, he could hardly ever be said to be sober. I see. Proceed. His manner towards the maid servant was disgustingly free and familiar. Worst of all, he assumed the same attitudes towards my daughter. 
and spoke to her more than once in a way which, fortunately, she's too innocent to understand. Mm. On one occasion, he actually seized her in his arms and embraced her. Even his own secretary reproached him for that. But why do you stand all this? I suppose you can get rid of your borders when you wish. Oh, would to God I'd given him notice the very day he came. But it was a sore temptation. They were paying a pound a day each. And this is the slack season. I'm a widow, and my boy in the Navy has cost me much. I acted for the best, Mr. Gregson, but this last was too much, however, and I gave him notice to leave on account of it. I see. My heart grew light when I saw him drive away. My son is on leave just now, but I did not tell him anything of all this. His temper is violent, and he is passionately fond of his sister. Mm-hmm. Well, when I closed the door behind them, a load seemed to be lifted from my mind. Alas, in less than an hour, there was a ring at the bell, and I learned that Mr. Drebber had returned. As usual, he was the worst for drink. He forced his way into the room where I was sitting with my daughter and made some incoherent remark about having missed his train. He then turned to Alice and, before my very face, proposed to her that she should fly with him. You are of age, he said. There's no law to stop you. I have money enough and to spare. Never mind the old girl here. Come along with me now, straight away. You shall live like a princess. Go on, madam. (laughs) Well, poor Alice was so frightened that she shrank away from him. But he caught her by the wrist. I screamed. And at that very moment, my son Arthur came into the room. What happened then, I do not know. I heard oaths and the confused sounds of a scuffle. I was too terrified to raise my head. When I did look up, I saw Arthur standing in the doorway, laughing with a stick in his hand. I don't think that fine fellow will trouble us again, he said. I'll just go after him and see what he does with himself. With these words... He took his hat and started off down the street. Madame Chapontier, at what hour did your son return? I do not know. He has a latch key. He let himself in. After you went to bed? Yes. When did you go to bed? About eleven. So your son was gone at least two hours? Yes. Possibly four or five? Yes. What was he doing during that time? I... I do not know, sir. I do not know. Of course, after that, there was only one thing to do. I found out where Lieutenant Charpentier was and arrested him. Now, when I touched him on the shoulder and warned him to come quietly with us, he answered us as bold as brass, I suppose you're arresting me for being concerned in the death of that scoundrel Drebber. We'd said nothing to him about it, so as his alluding to it had a most suspicious aspect. Very. What's more, he still carried that heavy stick. What is your theory, then, Inspector Gregson? Well, Mr. Holmes, my theory is that he followed Drebber as far as the Brixton Road. When there, some occasion arose between them, in the course of which Drebber received a blow from the stick in the pit of the stomach, perhaps, which killed him without leaving any mark. I see. The night was so wet that no one was about. So, Charpentier dragged the body of his victim into the empty house. Well, as to the candle and the blood and the writing on the wall and the ring... They may all be so many tricks to throw the police on the wrong scent. Well done. Hmm. Really, Gregson, you're getting along. We shall make something of you yet. Yeah, well, I, I flatter myself that I have managed it rather neatly. <laughs> Charpentier volunteered a statement in which he said that after following Drebber for some time, the latter perceived him and took a cab in order to get away from him. Then he said he met an old shipmate and took a long walk with him. On being asked where his old shipmate lived, he was unable to give any satisfactory reply. Well, I think the whole case fits together uncommonly well. <laughs> what amuses me is to think of Lestrade. He started off on the wrong scent, hasn't he? I'm afraid he won't make much of it. Uh, Mr. Holmes... Why, I, uh... by Jove, is the very man himself. Come in, Inspector Lestrade. Oh. So, uh... You're here, Gregson. Well, I suppose, Lestrade, you've come to consult Mr Sherlock Holmes. Ask him what move to make next, eh? Well, I don't mind admitting this is the most extraordinary case. 
A most incomprehensible affair. Ah, you find it so. I thought you would come to that conclusion. Have you managed to land the secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson? I have just come from Stangerson's room. We have been hearing Gregson's view of the matter. Would oh. you mind letting us know what you have done, Lestrade? Our whiskey, Inspector? Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, uh, no objection at all. I freely confess that I was of the opinion that Stangerson was concerned in the death of Trevor. Was? A fresh development has shown me that I was completely mistaken. Oh, well, well. I fancy we'd better take the events in their sequence. Oh, well, very well. Full of the one idea, I set myself to discover what had become of the secretary. He and Drebber had been seen together at Euston Station about half past eight on the evening of the third. Here you are, Inspector. Oh, uh, thank you, Doctor. <laughs> at two in the morning of the fourth, Drebber had been found murdered in the house off the Brixton Road. Now, the question which confronted me was to find out how Stangerson had been employed between 8.30 and the time of the crime. And what had become of him afterwards. I telegraphed to Liverpool, giving a description of the man and warning them to keep a watch upon the American boats. Did you? Oh, yes. Yeah. I then set to work, calling upon all the hotels and lodging houses in the vicinity of Euston. You see, I argued that if Drebber and his companion had become separated that evening, the natural course for Stangerson would be to uh, put up somewhere in the vicinity for the night and then to hang about the station again next morning to look out for his employer. They would be likely to agree on some meeting place beforehand. So it proved. I spent the whole of yesterday evening making inquiries entirely without avail. This morning, I began very early, and at eight o'clock I reached Halliday's private hotel in Little George Street. Good morning, sir. Can I help you? Yeah, I hope so. Of course. Whether Mr. Stangerson is living here. Oh, indeed, sir. Oh. No doubt uh, you were the gentleman he was expecting. He's been waiting for a gentleman for two days. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, where is he now? He's upstairs in bed, sir. He wished to be called at nine. I will go up and see him at once, then. Yes, sir. The boots will take you. Boots? Yes, sir. Morning, sir. Uh, take uh, this gentleman up to Mr. Stangerson's room. Yes, sir. Uh, would you follow me, sir? This room, sir. Uh, just along here. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, cool. What's that? Hmm? It looks like blood coming from under his door. You're right. It's locked, sir. Stand out of the way while I put my shoulder to it. Uh, but, sir... Get back. Stangerson had been stabbed to the heart, dead for some time. He'd bled profusely. But now comes the strangest part of the affair, Mr. Holmes. What do you suppose was on the wall? The word Rache, written in letters of blood. Yeah, that was it. Great heavens. Get on with the details, Lestrade. Well, the murderer was seen. A milk boy happened to walk down the lane at the back of the hotel. He noticed that a ladder, which usually lay there, was raised against one of the windows of the second floor, which was wide open. He looked back and saw a man descend the ladder. He came down so openly that the lad imagined him to be some carpenter or joiner at work. He took no notice, beyond thinking it was early for anyone like that to be at work. But he had an impression that the man was tall, had a reddish face, and was dressed in a long brownish coat. Did you find anything in the room which could furnish a clue to the murderer? Nothing. Stangerson had 80-odd pounds in his pocket. Whatever the motive for these two crimes, it certainly wasn't robbery. There were no papers in the pockets except a telegram dated from Cleveland about a month ago and containing the words, J.H. is in Europe. There was no sender's name. And there was nothing else? Nothing of any importance. His pipe was on the chair beside the bed. There was a glass of water on the table. And on the window sill, a small chip ointment box containing a couple of pills. At last. What's that, Mr. Holmes? The last link. My case is complete. Oh, now, what do you mean, Mr. Holmes? I have now in my hands all the threads which have formed such a tangle. I will give you proof of my knowledge. 
Could you lay your hand upon those pills, Lestrade? Well, I have them here. But I don't attach any importance to them, though. Let me see them. Doctor, are those ordinary pills? Ah, uh, no, they're certainly not. Pearly grey colour, small, round and almost transparent against the light. From their lightness and transparency, I should imagine that they are soluble in water. Precisely so. Watson, yesterday Mrs. Hudson asked you to put down that terrier of hers that has been ill for so long. Yes, I was going to... Would you to... bring the dog now? Oh, very well, Holmes. Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Holmes? I will cut one of these pills in two. One half we return into the box. The other half I will place in this wine glass. If you'd be kind enough to pass me the carafe, Lestrade. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, here you are. Thank you. Uh, now I pour into the glass a teaspoonful of water. Uh -huh. You perceive that our friend the doctor is right. The pill readily dissolves. Yes, this may be very interesting, Mr. Holmes, but... I can't see what it has to do with the death of Mr. Joseph Stangerson. Patience, my friend, patience. You will find in time that it has everything to do with it. I will now add a little milk. There he is. Poor old chap. Long past his allotted span, I'm afraid. Poor boy. Now, here's a drink for you. Well, what's supposed to happen now? The very pills which I suspected in the case of Drebber are actually found after the death of Stangerson. And yet they are inert. What can it mean? Surely my whole chain of reasoning cannot have been false. No, it's impossible. Well, if you ask me, Wait. I think you've... I have it. I have it. Where's that other pill? Here you are. Cut it in two and put it in the saucer. Very well. You mean you're going to try again? Precisely. This time... The unfortunate creature's tongue seemed hardly to have been moistened when it gave a convulsive shiver in every limb and lay as rigid and lifeless as if it had been struck by lightning. Poor old chap. I should have had more faith. I ought to know by this time that when a fact appears to be opposed to a long train of deductions, it invariably proves to be capable of bearing some other interpretation. Of the two pills in that box... One was of the most deadly poison, and the other was entirely harmless. Ah, I ought to have known that before ever I saw the box at all. Well, I don't like saying it in front of you, Gregson, but I'm right out of my depth. I really am. You're not alone, Lestrade. I can't make head nor tail of it. It is a mistake to confound strangeness with mystery. The most commonplace crime is often the most mysterious because it presents no new or special features from which deductions may be drawn. This murder would have been infinitely more difficult to unravel had the body of the victim been simply found lying in the roadway without any of those outré and sensational accompaniments which have rendered it remarkable. These strange details have really had the effect of making it less difficult. Now look here, Mr. Holmes. We want something more than mere theory and preaching now. It's a case of taking the man. I have made my case out, and it seems I was wrong. Young Charpentier is locked up and couldn't have been engaged in this second affair. Destrade went after his man, Stangerson, and appears he was wrong, too. Can you name the man who did it? Now, right, Holmes, if I may say so. Any delay in arresting the murderer might give him time to perpetrate some fresh atrocity. There will be no more murders. You can put that consideration out of the question. You have asked me if I know the name of the murderer. I do. Mr. The Holmes. mere knowing of his name is a small thing, however, compared with the power of laying our hands upon him. This I expect very shortly to do. But how? I have good hopes of managing it through my own arrangements, but it is a thing which needs delicate handling. We have a shrewd and desperate man to deal with. As long as this man has no idea that anyone has a clue, there is some chance of securing him. But if he had the slightest suspicion, he would change his name and vanish in an instant among the four million inhabitants of this great city. Without meaning to hurt either of your feelings... I am bound to say that I consider him to be more than a match for the official force, oh, and that really? is why I have not asked your assistance. Now, look here. If I fail, I shall, of course, incur all the blame due to this omission. But that I am prepared for. Well, I don't know about that. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Your cab is at the door, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Mr. Gregson, 
Why don't you introduce this pattern of handcuffs at Scotland Yard? See how beautifully the spring works. Yeah, the old pattern's good enough, sir, if we can only find a man to put them on. Very good. Very good. The cabman may as well help me with my boxes. Just ask him to step up, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, sir. Holmes, you never said anything about setting out on a journey. Nor I did, Watson. However, I must just get this small portmanteau ready. What is this, Mr. Holmes? Yes, Holmes, I, I really think... It's not been used for so long. Oh, these buckles are dreadfully difficult. Well, I'll help you. No, the cabman can do it. Ah. There you are, my good man. Yes, Governor. Just give me a help with this buckle, if you please. Oh, all right, sir. <clears throat> what? Oh, Gentlemen, oh, no. let me introduce you to Mr. Jefferson Hope, the murderer of Enoch Drebber and Joseph Stangerson. Jefferson, Jefferson Hope, Hope, I arrest I you. I think, in... Mr. Lestrade, in view of my seniority of service. Oh, very well. Jefferson Hope, I arrest you in the Queen's name for the murders of Enoch Drebber and Joseph Stangerson. I must caution you that anything you say will be taken down and may be put in evidence. Oh, Willis. All right, I've got a good deal to say. And I want to tell you gentlemen all about it. But if there's a vacant place for a chief of police, sir, I reckon you're the man for it, sir. Never mind about that. No, I mean it. Oh, the way you kept on my trail was a caution. Hadn't you better reserve that for your trial? I, I may never be tried. What? No, you needn't look so startled. It isn't suicide I'm thinking of. Uh, you're a doctor, aren't you? I am. Uh, and put your hand here on my chest. Well, um, yes. As you wish. Well? Why? This man has a, an aortic aneurysm. Uh, yep, well, that's what they call it. I went to a doctor last week about it, and... He told me that it's bound to burst before many days have passed. It's been getting worse for years. I got it from overexposure and underfeeding among the Salt Lake Mountains. Well, I have done my work now, and I don't care how soon I go. But I should like to leave some account of the business behind me. You see, I, I don't want to be remembered as a common murderer. Uh, Dr. Wilson. Yes, Inspector. Do you consider there is immediate danger? Most certainly that is. Mm. In that case, it's clearly our duty, in the interest of justice, to take his statement. Uh, will you write it down, please, Mr. Lestrade? All right. Uh, I've cautioned you, and you're at liberty to give your account, which this officer will take down. I understand. Uh, I'll sit down with your leave. By all means. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, this aneurysm of mine makes me easily tired. You see, I'm... I'm on the brink of the grave, and I'm not likely to lie to you gentlemen. Right, I'm ready. Proceed, then. All right. Now, it doesn't matter much to you why I hated those two men. It's enough that they were guilty of the death of two human beings, a father and a daughter, and that they had therefore forfeited their own lives. After the lapse of time that's passed since their crime, it was impossible for me to secure a conviction against them in any court. I knew of their guilt, though, and I determined that I should be judge, jury, and executioner all rolled into one. And you'd have done the same if, if you have any manhood in you, if you'd been in my place. That, sir, is a very large assumption. Oh, uh, is it, Doctor? <laughs> well, perhaps it is, but then you haven't yet heard all the facts. That girl that I spoke of was to have married me in America 20 years ago. However, she was forced into marrying Drebber and broke her heart over Even so, to take the law into one's own she hands. She broke her heart, sir. Because the marriage into which she was forced wasn't hideous to her merely because she loathed her prospective partner. She was also expected to share him with seven other wives. Drebber, sir, was a member of the Mormon community of Salt Lake who openly practiced polygamy. Yeah. Stangerson, who also at one time sued for her hand, had only four wives. He felt this gave him some advantage. Oh, God. No, but let me continue. I took the marriage ring from my dead Lucy's finger, and I vowed that Drebber's dying eyes should rest upon that very ring. 
and that his last thoughts should be of the crime for which he was being punished. I carried it about with me and followed him and his accomplice over two continents until I caught him. And if I die tomorrow, as is likely enough, I die knowing that my work in this world is done and well done. Yes, yes, yes. Well, get on. Right, all right. When I got to London, my pocket was about empty, and I found I must turn my hand to something for my living. Now, driving and riding are as natural to me as walking, so I applied at a cab owner's office and soon got employment. Well, it was some time before I found out where my two gentlemen were living. They were boarding at a boarding house at Camberwell over on the other side of the river. Go where they would about London. <laughs> I was always at their heels. Sometimes I followed them in my cab, sometimes on foot. But the former was the best, for then they couldn't get away from me. Will you get on? Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Drebber himself, you see, was drunk half the time, but Stangerson... <laughs> He wasn't to be caught napping. My only fear was that this thing in my chest might burst a little too soon and leave my work undone. But at last, one evening, I was driving up and down Torquay Terrace when I saw a cab drive up to their door. Presently, some luggage was brought out, and after a time, Drebber and Stangerson followed it and drove off. I whipped up my horse and kept within sight of them, feeling very ill at ease, for I feared that they were going to shift their quarters. At Euston Station, they got out, and I followed them onto the platform. I got near enough to hear what they were saying. Teddy, there isn't another Liverpool train for us. So who cares? I care. The sooner we're on a train to Liverpool and getting out of here, the happier I'll be. Well, Stangerson, we'll just have to wait, won't we? Come to think of it, I have a little business of my own to do. If you just hang around here someplace, I'll go off and I'll join you later. Like hell. He swore we'd always stick together. If you go, I'm going with you. Well, now, this little matter is kind of delicate. You'd, uh, uh, you'd be in the way. Oh, is that so? Well, either I go with you or we both stay here. You can take it or leave it, Trevor. Now, look here, Stangerson. It's about time you remembered you're nothing more than a paid servant around here. Now, who the hell do you think you are trying to dictate to me? Yeah, I, I didn't mean that way. Well, that's how it sounded to me. Now, you cut it out once and for all. Okay, then. But look, supposing you're not back in time for the train. It's the last one out tonight. I'll be back here before 11. I'll tell you what. If I'm not, we'll meet up again at Halliday's Hotel. Does that suit you? I guess it'll have to. The moment for which I had waited so long had come at last. My plans were already formed. It chanced that some days before, a gentleman who'd been looking over some empty houses off the Brixton Road had dropped a key of one of them in my carriage. How to get Drebber to that house was the problem. There was a hansom in front of mine, and he hailed it. I followed it for miles until, to my astonishment, we found ourselves back in the terrace where he'd been lodging. Well, I went on, and I pulled up my cab a hundred yards or so from the house. He entered it, and his hansom drove away. I waited for a quarter of an hour or more. Then the door was flung open, and two men appeared. One of them was Drebber, and the other was a young chap whom I'd never seen before. You filthy hound! I'll teach you to insult an honest girl. Get your hands off me. If you aren't out of here inside ten seconds, I'll lay this cudgel across you so you won't be able to walk. Now, get on with it. Okay, you. okay, I'm going. Hey, you, cabby. Yes, Governor? Drive me to Halliday's private hotel. When I had him fairly inside my cab, my heart jumped so with joy that I feared lest at this last moment my aneurysm might go wrong. Now, I was once janitor and sweeper out of a laboratory in the States. Well, one day, I heard a professor lecturing on some alkaloid which was so powerful that the least grain meant instant death. So when they were all gone, you see, I helped myself to a little of it. I was a fairly good dispenser, so I worked this alkaloid into small soluble pills. And each pill I put in a box with a similar pill made without the poison. 
I was determined that when I had my chance, <laughs> my gentlemen should each have a draw out of one of the boxes while I ate the pill that remained. From that day, I had always my pill boxes about with me, and the time had now come when I was to use them. It was nearer one than twelve, and a wild, bleak night, blowing hard and raining in torrents. My hands were trembling and my temples throbbing with excitement. There wasn't a soul to be seen. And when I looked in at the cab window, I found Drebber huddled in a drunken sleep. Come on, Governor. Come on, wake up. Huh? Wake up, I say. Uh, oh, what's the matter? Well, it's time to get out, sir. Oh. oh. All right, Cabby. Uh, you better follow me, sir. Steady. Steady. Now, sir, here, take my arm. That's right. Right this way. Is this the hotel? Holidays? Come along inside, sir. So damn dark in here. Say, what kind of a hotel is this? Uh, this in lamp of light. Uh, I'll just light this candle. There. Now, ain't it, Trevor? Huh? Who am I? Who? who what, do you, what do you mean? I... No. No. Yes, you dog. I have hunted from Salt Lake City to St. Petersburg, and you've always escaped me. Well, now your wanderings have come to an end. No. Keep away from me. What do you think of poor Lucy Ferrier now, huh? Punishment has been slow in coming, but it has overtaken you at last. Well, what are you going to do? Murder me? Uh, uh, who talks of murder in a man? Dog! What mercy had you upon my poor darling when you dragged her from her slaughtered father and bore her away to your accursed and shameless heroine? It, it wasn't I killed her father. Yeah, but it was you who broke her innocent heart. Let the high God judge between us. Now, I, here, you see this box? What, what is it? What are they? They're just a couple of pills. Choose and eat. Huh? Ah, there's death in one and life in the other. Oh. And I shall take what you leave. Now, let us see if there's justice upon the earth or if we're ruled by chance. Poison! You're mad! I won't do Oh, yes, you will! With my knife at your throat. Just keep away from me! Now, do as I say. Choose and eat. Oh, I won't. Oh, yes, you will! This way you have a 50-50 chance. If you don't take it, it'll be my knife. And no chance for you at all. All right. All right. I'll, I'll take it. All right. Now, I'll take the other, and we shall see. Eat it. It doesn't taste. Yeah. Hey, you've got it. You... Turned him over with my foot and placed my hand upon his heart. There was no movement. He was dead. The pulses in my temples were beaten like sledgehammers, and I believe I would have had a fit of some sort if the blood hadn't gushed from my nose and relieved me. Now, I remembered a German being found in New York with Rach written up above him, and it was argued that the secret societies must have done it. I guess that what puzzled the New Yorkers would puzzle Londoners, so I dipped my finger in my own blood and printed it on the wall. Then I walked down to my cab. I had driven some distance when I put my hand into the pocket in which I usually kept Lucy's ring, and, and I found that it wasn't there. It was the only memento I had of her. So I drove back, and leaving my cab in a side street, I went boldly up to the house. Well, I walked right into the arms of a police officer who was coming out. I managed to fool him by pretending to be hopelessly drunk, but I I had to go away without that ring. So much for dribbling. How about Stangerson? Well, I knew he was staying at Halliday's Hotel, so... Early next morning, I took advantage of some ladders which were lying in the lane behind the hotel and so made my way into his room in the gray of the dawn. I woke him up 
and told him he was to answer for the life he'd taken so long before. I gave him the same choice of poison pills. Where well, he sprang from his bed and flew at my throat. In self-defense, I, I stabbed him to the heart. Oh, I see. Have you anything more to say? Well, not much. I, I'm about done up, gentlemen. I, I went on cabbing, intending to save enough to take me back to America. I was standing in the yard when a ragged youngster asked if there was a cabbie there called Jefferson Hope and said that his cab was wanted by a gentleman at 221B Baker Street. Oh, I came around. Next thing I knew, this this man here had the bracelets on my wrist. Well, that's, that's the whole of my story, gentlemen. Now, uh, you may consider me to be a murderer, but I hold that I'm just as much an officer of justice as you are. Mm. You got all that, Mr. Lestrade? Every word. Well, is there anything you'd like to ask, Mr. Holmes? There is only one point of which I should like a little more information. Who was your accomplice who came for the ring? Now, sir, I can tell my own secrets, but <laughs> I don't get other people into trouble. I saw your advertisement. I... I thought it might be a plant. My friend volunteered to go and see, and I I think you'll admit that he did it smartly. Hmm. I, you have my word on it, though, gentlemen, that his connection with the whole business ends there. He had no hand in the deaths of those two men and knows nothing about them. Hmm. I think we can accept the truth of that, Gregson. Very well, Mr. Holmes. But now, gentlemen, the forms of the law must be complied with. The prisoner will be brought before the magistrates, and your attendance will be required. Well, that's understood, Inspector. Until then, I will be responsible for him. Come along, if you please, Mr. Lestrade. Good night. He may as well use his own cab, but I'm afraid we can hardly let him drive it. Uh, you'll have to oblige. I, uh... Oh, never mind. At least I can drive a cab. Come along, Hope. Let's be moving. We had all been warned to appear before the magistrates upon the Thursday. But when the Thursday came, there was no occasion for our testimony. A higher judge had taken the matter in hand, and Jefferson Hope had been summoned before a tribunal where strict justice would be meted out to him. On the very night after his capture, the aneurysm burst, and he was found in the morning stretched upon the floor of his cell, with a placid smile upon his face, as though he'd been able in his dying moments to look back upon a useful life and on work well done. Will there still be a court hearing? I mean, now that he's dead? Oh, yes. The formalities will have to be observed. Mm, it won't be the same, though. I must admit, the trial would have been pretty interesting. Mm. Never mind. I wouldn't have missed the investigation for anything. There's been no better case within my recollection. Simple as it was. Simple? Oh, really. It can hardly be described as otherwise. The proof of its intrinsic simplicity is that without any help, save a few very ordinary deductions, I was able to lay my hand upon the criminal within three days. That's true. But how? I've already explained to you that what is out of the common is usually a guide rather than a hindrance. In solving a problem of this sort, the grand thing is to be able to reason backwards. In the everyday affairs of life, it is more useful to reason forwards, and so the other comes to be neglected. There are 50 who can reason synthetically for one who can reason analytically. Well, I confess I, I don't... And this was a case in which you were given the result and had to find everything else for yourself. Now, I approached the house with my mind entirely free from all impressions. As I walked down the garden path, I saw the heavy footmarks of the constables, but I saw also the track of the two men who had first passed through the garden. It was easy to tell that they had been before the others, because in places their marks had been entirely obliterated by the others coming upon the top of them. This told me that the nocturnal visitors were two in number, one remarkable for his height, and the other fashionably dressed, to judge from the small and elegant impression left by his boots. What next? On entering the house, this inference was confirmed. My well-booted man lay dead before me. The tall one, then, had done the murder, if murder there was. Having sniffed the dead man's lips, I detected a slightly sour smell, and I came to the conclusion that he had been poisoned. I argued from the hatred and fear expressed upon his face, 
that the poison had been forced upon him. Oh, but Holmes, who ever heard of... Oh, do not imagine that it was a very unheard of idea. The forcible administration of poison in the cases of Dolsky in Odessa and Leturier in Montpellier will at once occur to any toxicologist. Is that so? Oh, yes. Now, I quickly came to the conclusion, since there were no signs of a struggle, that the blood which covered the floor had burst from the murderer's nose in his excitement. I could see that the track of blood coincided with the track of his feet. As a medical man, Watson, you will agree that it is seldom that any man breaks out in such a way unless he is very full-blooded, through emotion. Mm, quite true. So I hazarded the opinion that the criminal was a robust and ruddy-faced man. <laughs> As indeed he was. Quite so. You will remember that I ascertained that when Gregson telegraphed to America, he had not inquired as to any particular point which might appear to be critical. Yes. Well, bearing in mind the wedding ring, I telegraphed to the head of the police at Cleveland, limiting my inquiry to the circumstances connected with the marriage of Enoch Drebber. The answer was conclusive. It told me that Drebber had already applied for the protection of the law against an old rival in love named Jefferson Hope and that this same hope was at present in Europe. I knew now that I held the clue to the mystery in my hand, and all that remained was to secure the murder. Oh, all that remained? Oh, oh really? It wasn't so difficult. I'd already determined in my own mind that the man who had walked into the house with Drebber was none other than the man who had driven the cab. The marks on the road showed me that the horse had wandered on in a way which would have been impossible had there been anyone in charge of it. So you came to the conclusion that Jefferson Hope was to be found among the cabbies of the metropolis. Oh, brilliant, Holmes. Quite brilliant. Thank you, Watson. Yes, Mrs. Hudson. The echo's just come, Mr. Holmes. It's just throwing down, no, Mrs. Hudson. I'll look at it later. No, no. No, I'll have it, please. Oh, very good, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, shall you be into lunch, gentlemen? I fancy we shall. Thank you, sir. I say, listen to this, Holmes. The public have lost a sensational treat through the sudden death of the man Hope, who was suspected of the murders of Mr. Enoch Drebber and Mr. Joseph Stangerson. If the case has no other effect, it at least brings out in the most striking manner the efficiency of our detective police force. <laughs> it is an open secret that the credit for this smart capture belongs entirely to the well-known Scotland Yard officials, Messrs. Gregson and Lestrade. It is expected that a testimonial of some sort will be presented to these two officers as a fitting recognition of their service. <laughs> Well, Holmes, what about that? Didn't I tell you so when we started, Watson? That's the result of all our study in Scarlet. To get them a testimonial. 